Great. So welcome everyone to another episode of Voices of Fuveki. I'm very pleased to have as my guest, uh, uh, Jules Evans. He's uh, a writer, uh, a public intellectual, a teacher. Um, I first met Jules in a really a book, a really extraordinary book, and I highly recommend this book, uh, Philosophy for Life and Other Dangerous Situations, Ancient Philosophy for Modern Problems. And for those of you who are in connection with some of the other work I've done, or going through the Wisdom of Hypatia or reading uh, Pierre Hadot, this is an excellent book to add to the mix, excellent book to add to the mix. Uh, and it, it's much more comprehensive in the, in the various uh, philosophies that are reviewed um, in the book. And Jules does more than review them. He shows you how there was an art associated with each way of, uh, you know, philosophical way of life and how that might translate into practices, etc. cetera. And, and then Jules and I were both on a Rebel Wisdom documentary together about sort of the effect of uh, COVID might be having on sort of the public psyche. Um, and uh, Jules and I both made predictions about how it was going to have sort of um, uh, existential and mental health effects that weren't properly being adequately discussed. Jules coined, I think, a wonderful term, which I've been using since, conspirituality, to talk about this weird emergence of this weird integration of conspiracy theory and spirituality. Um, and so uh, I thank him just for that term. That's a very useful uh, uh, term to have uh, in our conceptual vocabulary. And then Jules had, uh, I had the pleasure of interacting with Jules on Rebel Wisdom. He was running, and I hope he does it again in the future. He was doing their uh, Book of the Month Club. And um, I was on talking about one of the books that had influenced me, uh, Pierre Hadot's uh, Ancient Philosophy. And I found in my great pleasure that Jules was also deeply influenced by that book and we really clicked. And so I, I, I wanted uh, to invite Jules, I invited him at that time on here because I wanted to talk to him about you know, the, the connections uh, between uh, philosophy in, in sort of modern academic sense, philosophy as, as a way of life and spirituality, meaning making, the cultivation of wisdom, self-transcendence. So first of all, uh, Jules, welcome. And I'm, I'm very, very glad you're here. Thanks for having me, John. Um, I should say, uh, I'd love to take credit for that term, conspirituality. Um, it was in a, a little red um oh. paper of 10 years ago i all, i resurrected it okay at the, at, at the moment when conspirituality went massive in the last 12 months so it was it was by two anthropologists um charlotte ward and david voas they well, they they have the credit well it's decent of you to give them uh, uh uh due credit but nevertheless you are due credit for bringing it into prominence at a very appropriate time um, and so thank yes, you alas, that. we you know because because of this just um, this boom in conspiracy thinking that's happened in, in spiritual circles, yeah. So Jules, I wanted to start by, and, and I'm hoping this will just you know evolve into what I call dialogos. But um, you make it, you start the book, um, mm -hmm. uh, of course, with the figure of Socrates, and you introduce this distinction, which I I really liked, and and that uh, you made a distinction between street philosophy, which Socrates is doing. In the ancient agora um, and, and academic philosophy, which is, I by and large, I think what most people's idea of philosophy, if they even have a conception of philosophy, but the conception they have of philosophy these days is something that's done academically. It's a very technical kind of enterprise. It's almost incestuous. The philosophers largely talk to themselves, um, mm -hmm. and, and both you and I have degrees in academic philosophy, um, and so. You, but you, you weren't trying to denigrate uh, academic philosophy with the distinction. You made a very clear point uh, that they have kind of a symbiotic relationship, uh, namely mm -hmm. that, uh, and I liked your turn of phrase, you said that academic philosophy keeps street philosophy coherent and street philosophy keeps academic philosophy relevant. I wonder if you, I mean, you wrote that nine years ago, so I'm sure that, uh, you know, yeah. your thinking has, has moved beyond there, but maybe, you know, starting from there, what, what what would you like to say? What would you like to bring up? Well, um, yes, yeah, so I guess the idea of street philosophy was in in that book, I found people um, from many different walks of life who um, used philosophy, who tried to follow ancient philosophies, yeah. um, like a, a an ex-mafioso who came across Plutarch 
uh, in in a prison, and he, he got inspired by this this idea of imitating moral lives. Right. Or a um a, a cop in Chicago with an anger problem, who read Seneca, and it helped him to learn how to manage his temper. Um, and I was really impressed by these people who were really trying these ideas and really like seeing if they worked in very difficult situations and other ones like a, a, a major who taught a kind of Socrates cafe in Baghdad during the yeah. Iraq war. Yeah. Um, so they, they were really testing out these ideas in the kind of crucible of, of, of human experience, of sometimes extreme experience. That's why it's called like philosophy for life and other dangerous situations. Right. So that's the kind of street philosophy thing that they're, they're really trying to be um, to true to it, see if these ideas work as a as a way of life, and we both love that. You know, Pierre Hadot, this French yeah. uh, academic, and he one one of his books is called Philosophy as a Way of Life, and he exactly. reminded us that these ancient philosophies, like Stoicism, were not just theories. Uh, as Epictetus said, you may be fluent in the lecturum, but go out into the street and you're hopelessly shipwrecked. Mm. So. In street philosophy, the true test is how do you cope with, um, you know, when you get hit by adversity or by good fortune, how, you know, by success, how, how, you know, so this is the test of street philosophy. So that's very important to me. Um, and I was very impressed by, by the people I interviewed in my book. But at the same time, without some kind of critical rigor, an attempt to kind of try and work out, you don't necessarily have to be 100% um, loyal to what the ancient Greek Stoics were teaching or like the Roman Stoics, but it's helpful if you try to get where they're coming from mm -hmm. and try to understand what, what they mean, then you can totally riff off it and, and, and you know, but there's something to be said for, 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 for kind of that careful reading uh, you know, historical reading and so on. And that's what um, academia broadly, you know, uh, broadly described can give us that kind of um, critical thinking, careful reading, uh, a historical view. So uh, it, it's, you know, uh, it's, it's trying to balance that. I think in a lot of my work, I'm trying to, you know, in, in the next book I wrote, I was looking at ecstatic experiences, how to both surrender to them but also retain one's critical thinking, which is right. which is quite right. a complex maneuver. Yeah. How to balance the Socratic and the Dionysiac. Yeah. So maybe a bit like you, I, I, you know, I I I I describe myself as semi-academic. Mm. So I, I, you know, I, I I appreciate what academia does. I appreciate, you know, that yeah. the, the yeah. academics aren't, aren't always just hustling for likes. They're not hype, you know. A good academic isn't isn't in, isn't trying to hype their research. Exactly. There's like they're doing careful archival yeah. work, textual yeah. criticism. Um, however, um, and and an academic would probably say, I, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be a good person. I'm not trying to teach my students how to be good people. I'm just trying to teach them how to understand a theory. Right. Um, and that's really important, but you, you can see how that can miss out something as well, yes, yes, which much. is, um, you know, the practical. And, and what I see, what I saw in the university where I worked for eight years was a huge demand among students right. for meaning, for practical advice, yeah. um, for ways to uh, understand their minds, change their emotions and... Um, to, to me, like to talk about ancient philosophy without telling people about its practical use is like, you know, pouring over the manual for a Ferrari and, and never taking it for a drive. Right, right, right. right. Um, I, might, I, I, I bet you're, you know, I, I, you probably, there are some similarities between your kind yeah. of experience. Very much. And so, uh, yeah, and, and let's get into that uh, eventually, mm -hmm. but and maybe helping us move towards that is one of the things that, that comes to my mind that I've been trying to work out bridging between, uh, you know, the, the academic world of theory and the street world of practice, if you'll just allow me those broad categories, is mm -hmm. getting clear about what this space is. So let me, let me phrase it as a question to you, to you, and I want to hear what you say first, and then mm -hmm. because it sounds like you and I, and, and, and I'm happy that you're including me, I do, I agree, mm -hmm. We're trying to find the space between theory and therapy. 
I mean, and, and to be fair, like you, you talk about the connections between things like stoicism and therapy, CBT, there's close connections and close similarities. And, uh, you know, and some of the, the thing that, you know, when I'm in, interacting with other, uh, other people that are involved in these emerging communities of authentic discourse and relating, they try to say, well, we're not doing therapy, we're not doing therapy. It's like, you're right. And so what is that space? Like, uh, I, I, I think we don't properly have a, a reference term for it, but nevertheless, maybe we could try and get a little bit, maybe we could elucidate it and clarify it, like by contrasting mm. it. Uh, what, what's the space between theory and therapy? Well, I mean, I definitely had many colleagues who were interested in the space between um, subjective first person forms of writing yeah. and objective academic third person forms of writing. I worked at a place called the Center for the History of the Emotions. Right. So for example, there, there was a colleague there, um, um, Barbara Walters, and she was a historian of uh, psychiatry and of, uh, you know, uh, psych psychiatric facilities, asylums, but she also wrote about her own experience about being sectioned. Yeah. And so she would combine these, these, these two voices. So um, that kind of blend, uh, you know, is you, you come across it in academia, where I think, I, you know, I sometimes felt a little bit out on a limb within, within my department was I, I wasn't interested not only in the, in the kind of first person voice, yeah. but also um, I suppose in like what helps people that kind of transformative mm -hmm. type of space. Um, so yes, um, therapy, but also like in the broader, an ancient sense of like care of the soul. Yes. So I found sometimes my academic colleagues, you, you said we all study different emotions, the history of different emotions, 90% of it, of, of, of the work in the center was on negative emotions. Right, right. Shame, right. fear, crying, right. you know, that kind of thing. And I, I would occasionally work on things like flourishing and well-being or right. even ecstatic experience. And there was, there was a, a discomfort with that in academia. But, I mean, let me, I'll tell you, I'll tell you people I admire in that space. Because, um, for example, um, I admire like the work of Jeffrey Kripal. Mm -hmm. um, he's a historian of, do you know his stuff? No, I've heard the name though. I've heard right. The name. So he's a historian uh, of religious studies mm -hmm. at Rice University. And he does really good historical analysis of, of, of spirituality, of the history of spirituality. And he also brings in um, his own experience. He, he had the, the courage to write about a kind of erotic encounter he had with the goddess Kali in ah, Bombay. Right. Um, you know, he also, you know, is, is, is not afraid of, of the marginal. He, he did a book with Whitley Strieber on UFOs. Um, and he both teaches at Rice University and he's the director of research at Esalen. And so he, as, he, as he describes it, he's in that liminal space between mm. academia and something else. What, I mean, maybe it's kind of, you know, the whole personal transformation space, new age spirituality space, um, human potential space. Esalen itself was a bit like that. Uh, Esalen, the kind of what, it's hard even to know what to call it. It was, it was somewhere between a college and an ashram maybe. Right. Right. But it wasn't an ashram in that there was never any one guru, and that was quite important. So it had this slogan, no one captures the flag. Right. Um, you had different speakers and teachers coming there, often from academia, Joseph Campbell or Abraham Maslow, and they'd run right. courses and seminars. But you also had, um, you know, full on stuff going on there. You had, uh, you know, uh the hot tubs you had the naked right. massages you had people tripping you, all, yeah. all this so it, it, you know it wasn't it wasn't just an academic seminar though you, you you'd have that kind of that that level of of, of hopefully that level of of intellectual sophistication but it was but it was open to um not just the, the intellectual level but other levels sure. of knowing um, it was inspired by Aldous Huxley, and he talked about integrated education, mm. the intellectual, but also what he called the nonverbal humanities, the somatic, right, right. Um, the ecstatic, um, the ecological, 
Um, so, I mean, that's some thoughts, yeah. So, so let me see if I can uh, respond on that. Uh, something I'm getting from it, maybe let, let me know if it's representing at least a uh, dimension of what you're saying. It sounds like, you know, the space that you, you were, we're talking about is a space that has pursues intellectual rigor like academic philosophy, uh, but is also pursuing a kind of personal transformation like what you have in therapy, but like where, but the academic philosophy leaves out the therapeutic sort of transformation. The therapeutic transformation often leaves out uh, um, the, the intellectual training. And so we're trying to find a space that says, no, there's, there's, a, there's a space of practices in which those are actually integrated together uh, rather than being sort of secluded from each other. Does that land for you? Does that sound good? Yes, um, that's, that does. Though um, I think another thing as well is like, I wrote one book, Philosophy for Life, which yeah. was about, um, you know, the dialogue between ancient philosophies and modern therapies and how these can help people today. So it looked at um, kind of CBT, yeah. overcoming things like anxiety and so on, and it also looked at like flourishing and positive psychology. Yeah. That fitted uh, relatively well into contemporary academia, more or less, though certainly I remember doing a talk at Durham University. And while I was waiting to give my talk, I saw an academic pick up the book, look at it, and he tossed it down and said, well, this is just self-help. So, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, because it was because it wasn't afraid to kind of give people practical advice and tell yeah. people stories. But um, but there's th 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 there's another twist as well, is that I think maybe we're, we're also both interested in like things like altered states of consciousness, things right, like right. virtuality, things like questions of the soul, um, uh, ultimate exactly. questions like, is there a God? If so, how do we connect with it? Excellent. Now on that, yeah. then my academic colleagues were often like, has Jules gone off the reservation? Yeah. Because it, it's one thing to challenge the kind of, the, the, the wall between the theoretical and the practical, but it's, it's another thing to start to challenge um, the um, materialist paradigm, which is the presumed yeah. um, background for, for modern academia. So that that that's excellent, and I think that brings in a third potential contrast, and uh, the the contrast uh, between uh, we might call it the spiritual dimension between what we're talking about and perhaps established religion. Again, there's similarities and differences, and maybe we can uh, bring that in. I, and um, I'm um, I'm totally in agreement with what you're talking about. Fortunately, um, because I'm in in uh, cognitive science and the cognitive science was deeply influenced by Evan Thompson and um, you know what that means is people are much I mean you know physicalism is still the dominant you know paradigm um, I think outside of the the cognitive science which is looking very closely at the mind-body relationship most people are still sort of physical reductionists, most neuroscientists are, for example. But within cognitive science, especially within 4E cognitive science, non-reductive uh, ontologies are becoming much more, uh, much more prevalent. And I think for a very good reason. I don't think that's just happenstance or but it's a fad or something. I think there's good argument and good evidence that's been building over you know, the last three decades for that. Um, largely the, in, in the inadequacy of a sort of purely formal systems computational theory of, of cognition, et cetera. Um, so so I, I, I have a little bit more, uh, I know, a little bit more of a welcoming home uh, 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 than you might have perhaps had. Um, and also what's been happening in conjunction with that, not, again, not haphazardly, but I think for deeply uh, uh, plausible reasons, um, is the exploration uh, of meaning, of altered states of consciousness, of uh, mystical experiences, psychedelic experiences, you know, all, uh, you know, and, and and pretty explicitly so, transformative experience, spirituality. These are now all uh, considered uh, legitimate topics. So, as theoretical topics, that's thing. More and more, we have we have researcher practitioners 
people who, while studying mindfulness, also have been practicing it for a long time, or while, while studying altered states of consciousness, have been practicing it. People, of course, aren't as, they're very reticent about talking about whether or not they've been experience, experiencing and experimenting with psychedelics, but nevertheless, there's a general understanding that these people are not just talking about psychedelics in the brain, they're also you know, pers experiencing personal uh, transformation via it. Uh, uh, and so there's also been a growing uh, um, acceptance uh, that we, are, we have to do both an inside and an outside reflection on these phenomena, both the appreciation of the phenomena and that we have to do both an inside and an outside reflection. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, I, 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 I firmly agree that you're exactly painting the picture uh, of mm. the dominant view. Uh, mm. But I also, I guess what I'm trying to say is I've been a little bit more uh, lucky in, see, in, in seeing that there's a lot that's pushing it back against that. And it's not just, you know, new age spirituality or like there's a lot that you can properly call bona fide scientific work and bona fide philosophical work that's pushing it back against that in, in a major, major way. Mm. And, and, mm -hmm. and the reason I bring that up and, 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 and then to turn things back over to you is that I, mean, I have a thesis that you're familiar with that I think the, the, that rise within academia, the rise mm. of work like what you're doing, and, and I don't mean to just mm. make you a symptom of anything, but mm. you know, the, the revival of stoicism, uh, you know, mm. the huge revival, the, the, the attempt, and it's going, I have a lot of criticisms of, of importing Buddhism and Taoism. Like all of yeah. this is, like I say, this is, these are, po these are, you might call them positive symptoms of the meaning crisis. And there's a lot of negative symptoms, which were exacerbated by COVID. Um, and I won't go into those in great detail. But so, mm. right, right. It, like, let me give you a historical analogy for my question. Like you, many mm -hmm. people have said, you know, you see, thing, you see people like uh, Pythagoras and Socrates and Plato arising because there was a vacuum sort of emerging in the established religion. The religion didn't go away in ancient Athens. It was still there, but it, something, it wasn't, it wasn't, it, it either stopped performing a function or it was incapable of performing a new and emergent function that was needed. And then philosophy emerged to try and fill this gap. And so is there a sense, and I, and I want to ask this question very respectfully of the established religions, mm. And I do respect them, right? Mm. Is there a sense in which, though, because the demographics seem to indicate that people are finding them inadequate for these questions, right? These questions of deep understanding, deep transformation, deep connection, and then they're turning to something else. Does that land with you? Does that does that does that make sense? Does that help to explain why we're getting this? Because, like I said, I, I'm privileged. I'm seeing a bit more of a change than you are uh, within academia. Well, yes, um, I think there's a, there's, uh, you know, definitely you can see that um, religious affiliation in the United States, and, I'd, and I'd, I'm not sure, you, you tell me about the situation in Canada, um, uh, plunged in the last 20 years. Yes. So it Even went down so from... Canada, more so in Canada than the United States. Oh, so in okay. So in the U.S., uh, you know, U.S. was always like the weird exception compared to Europe to the secularization thesis, yes. because, um, yes, the 60s kind of, you know, transformed it, but still uh, uh, religious affiliation stayed unusually high, whilst in Europe, um, it, it, it went down after the 60s below uh, 50 percent. So, you know, in the U.K., I, my, the U.K. is an incredibly secular country and comfortably so, really doesn't give... It's not spiritual, but not religious. It's neither spiritual nor religious. Like it's, it's <laughs> like just it doesn't even notice the absence of God anymore. Mm. As long as it's got strictly come dancing and the Great British Bake Off and a bit of football on TV, no, no problem, right? Right, right? But in in the US, um, it, you know, nineteen um, so nine well two uh, two thousand um, there was seventy percent of people religious affiliated. And it went down below 50% for the first time in American history last year. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, the particular steep drop off uh, among millennials. So you get this rise of the nuns, you know, yep, as in not yep. literally the nuns, but yeah, no, yeah. no religious affiliation. Um, and because, as I said to a friend today, 
Americans are so religious, even when they're post-religious, they're very post-religious. You know, they're still more religious than Europeans. So yes, you get this, a lot of interest in spirituality or, or in kind of uh, the, 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 the synthesis between psychology and spirituality and religion that you see in people like say Sam Harris or Jordan Peterson or in your own work. Right. So I suppose, it, it's, I mean, that's one way of making sense of it. Um, and of course there are all kinds of other things going on at the yeah. same time, yes, like, um, um, like the climate crisis, uh, yeah. like um, the decline in living standards, like the stagnation of, of the economy and of innovation. Um, and also, and, and, and I think, you know, new technology as well i think is 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 kind of feeding that appetite for autodidacticism for for, for, for yeah. people want to feed their heads i mean and 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 so so you know who'd have guessed that you know like a, a whole lecture series on 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 meaning would hit such a chord right like i mean like but the the, the people will sit through um you know they've really got an appetite for 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 content that demands something of them and you know you look at the rise of conspiracy theory culture and it, it, of course it's extremely negative um, for our societies but th the one kind of bit of light I see in it is people are devoting hours to trying to educate themselves yeah and yeah. trying to do their research now unfortunately they're going down the wrong rabbit holes and um, you know they're getting they're getting hooked into some you know simplistic maps but, but, you know, what, what a desire for autodidacticism, if that could be directed in a healthier direction. Yeah, and, and, and perhaps also if the autodidact, I mean, so there's, I agree with you uh, that that is like, that's an important thing. Um, as a cognitive psychologist, I'm worried about autodidactism uh, because of the mm -hmm. way in which it, uh, um, it's, you know, this is the sort of Part of the antipathy that your colleague directed towards self-help is precisely the way in which it tends to often just reinforce self-deceptive bias, all right? And then social media can exacerbate that and it, it can lead to conspirituality. Um, and mm. so I, I, I'm interested in, I'm interested in, in the, like you said, the, 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 the clear hunger for self-transcendence and self-improvement. Um, but I think the conspirituality also points to a hunger to connect. Uh, to other mm -hmm. people um, and, and to uh, and to some kind of community that can act, um, whether or not really or only in an earth satisfaction, as some kind of like what the what the ancient philosophical schools did, bringing some rigor and some challenge, uh, some way. I, I mean, we we basically get our ability to reflect on ourselves through other people, um, and, and so I see that hunger. Mm -hmm. and so. I, I get what you said about the UK being, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of happily secular, but mm -hmm. you know, the UK also is suffering from, by its own reports, a loneliness uh, epidemic, right? Yeah, no, and, sure. The UK, the UK has got all kinds of problems, and it tries to deal with it by this kind of new religion of wellness. Yes, like, that's like, exactly hey, what I wanted you. Yes, hey, great. Let, let's just let's you know, we used to be you speak think about English people, you think it's about a stiff upper lip. Yeah, like my God. Harry now, Prince Harry, God bless him. He's doing a, a mental health show with Oprah. He's doing a mental health podcast. He's just announced a new memoir. Like English people, all we do now is talk about our feelings. And, and, and like, we can't understand the more we worship the cult of wellness, the more miserable we are. And we can't yeah. figure it out. <laughs> so so that, that's the issue again. It seems like, again, that we're like trying to find this space between no, this is therapy, this is theory, is religion. I, I mean, I think there's what's seeming to sort of emerge for me in this conversation is it's both a needed space, but it's a space that's hard to get, hard to make salient, hard to get people to look at that space without them being very easily distracted into these more culturally recognized and established spaces. Um, what, what do you yeah. think about that as a proposal? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's, um, I, 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 I don't know. I, I don't, I don't feel it's necessarily as, as culturally confident a moment as say the Greek Renaissance, you know, yeah, the Greek yeah. enlightenment, yeah, right, right. like which was these strong new ideas. And I feel our, our time is a bit more like 
you know, uh, the uh, late antiquity, where, where you have all kinds of uh, ideas and cults uh, swilling around, and, you know, syncretistic and Stoicism was very popular. Then you had like Neoplatonic magic. You had yeah, yeah. new cults coming in from the East and Egypt. Yeah. You had pharaohs trying to live forever. Yeah. You know, like, uh, so it, I, 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 I suppose I, I, I mean, I, I sometimes, I don't know, maybe I'm more pessimistic than you, John. Like, um, I, I, I worry about our era and, and, and I, I, spirituality is my culture, but I'm, I, I worry about spirituality at the moment. I, I, I uh, you know, like um, the the lack of integrity sometimes. Yep. The hucksterism. Yep. The trolls, um, and, um, and, yep. and the hucksterism gets so kind of turbocharged by by the internet. You know. Yep. Very much. Um, and uh, so uh, you know, so 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 trying to balance kind of critical thinking um, with with hopefulness. And, 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 and with self-experimentation. What I think we've seen in the last 12 months is, is a real rise of critical thinking and spirituality. Yes. But, but, but that can end up um, in the hermeneutics of suspicion where you're just always calling out, yes, of course, like 90% of gurus are, are full of crap. Uh, and, you know, but you also, you can't just offer criticism. No, uh, no, there no. needs to be hopefulness. You need to offer people hope and consolation in this most difficult of times. Yeah, I, I would, I would reinforce that by saying, if the criticism is just dismissive criticism, I think it's half halfway criticism. I mean, I, I think more of like Kantian critique rather than criticism, where you're trying mm. to understand the functionality, right? You know, so mm. Kant's not just saying do away with this. He's saying, but but what's the underlying functionality and Let's properly understand it. Uh, and yeah. that's where I think, uh, you know, the cognitive psychology, the cognitive science can be a big help. Um, mm. But that leads me then to like your, your you know, your second book. And, uh, and I haven't had the pleasure to read that. So mm -hmm. I apologize if I ask things out of ignorance. Um, uh -huh. but, but you did bring up this, you know, you, you know the tension, uh, Socrates and Dionysus, sort of the, you know, and there's some allusions to Nietzsche there you, uh, you might want to explore. But um, uh, maybe you do in your book, um, but um, mm. how that that's that's the thing that uh, is that's what that's what I'm trying to also point to in this space is that I want to be able to offer people practices of self transcendence, ecstasy, fundamental self redirection, self transformation, while still nevertheless keeping them connected to critical reflection, to self-examination, to, to existential uh, self-doubt in, in important ways. And it sounds to me like you were wrestling with something like that in the second book. So where's your thinking about that issue? Because that issue, I mean, that issue concerns me both professionally and personally. Yeah. Um, it's a very interesting one. Um, can you have a model of education of pedagogy, which includes um, the mystical uh, yeah. and includes ecstasis and altered yeah. states of consciousness, because those kinds of states involve the uh, hopefully temporary turning off sometimes of, of, of critical thinking, or at least going beyond just the analytical and the critical. Yes. yes. Maybe yes. not the turning off, maybe the, hopefully the kind of you know, yes, and rather yeah. than, you know, turn off your mind. But um, when one goes into those um, altered states, one can very easily fall prey to um, uh, cultishness, to black and white thinking, yeah, to manipulation, to, uh, yeah. uh, them and us, in crowd, out crowd, to guru worship. Um, so um, I remember in our converse, last conversation, I talked about, uh, you know, Abraham Maslow, talking about what leads to peak experiences and he, and he was like sometimes the lecture can lead to peak experiences you know uh, maybe um but if you are giving people peak experiences in your pedagogy you can become a guru and you know various people have talked about you know what 
a guru is a certain thing, but it's something a bit different from, I don't know, certainly an academic or a teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but then maybe was Plato kind of a guru? I mean, so there's different ways one can think about it. Okay, here's some thoughts off the top of my head. Um, Ken Wilber, who kind of fell prey to the guru thing, but he talks yeah. about the difference between a guru and a pandit. A pandit kind of describes a certain um, body of knowledge and might share some of their experiences, but it's different from the guru who's actually kind of taking responsibility for your soul yeah. and, and trying to lead you to a certain state of mind. So that's one thought. Maybe there's a difference between the guru and the pandit. I'm certainly much more comfortable with the pandit role than the guru role. Mm. Another thing to think about is models of educational institutions, precedents, which have tried to teach both knowledge and theory and also be a space for the exploration of not, you know, the non, the non-rational, the trans-rational. So I've thought about that a lot, historical precedents for that kind of thing mm -hmm. that I'm interested in. And so I've thought about places like um, Esalen, places like Naropa Institute, which yeah. Chogram Rinpoche set up in Boulder, um, places like Schumacher College in Devon and Dartington right next to it. Um, and you can see that they sometimes go wrong. Um, they go wrong because they, be uh, like say something like Naropa or the Mind and Life Institute, they, um, they, they became um, a bit, uh, somewhat kind of cultic uh, in their thinking, uh, or at least, you know, they, 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 they were so into what they were doing that they suffered from confirmation bias. Yeah, they became so, apologetic too. They became an apology. Mind and life I'm familiar with. And there was an, it, it yeah. started, it be, and I was there with Evan Thompson, who was, you know, Varela's yeah. protege. And Evan was mm. getting upset and, you know, about that, that it was turning into a Buddhist apologetic program. Uh, yeah. Which, right. And, and so, sorry, I interrupted you. I'm just yeah. like, I'm reinforcing. No, right, right. Right. I, yeah, yeah. You know more about that situation than me. And, and I think definitely, I imagine something similar happened at the Maharishi yeah. University. Um, so it's tricky. You see kind of the normal model of academia and you think, oh, that's kind of arid and desiccated. And, you know, I, I had the pleasure to kind of meet and interview the former president of Harvard, Derek Bock. And he's, he's brilliant. He says, yes, we should have a place for teaching mindfulness. Yes, we should have a place for to trying to teach kind of happiness and, and things like that. But it's, um, it's always about, you know, creating a space where the student can disagree with you mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and say, yeah, you know, and, and, and take it in a new direction. And um, so, so that's that. It, it, it is it is hard. It is really hard because um, something Aldous Huxley said to the to the founders of Esalen, right when they were setting it up, is you know, um, you, you sometimes have to. You, you, it's things might get messy because you're talking about altered states of consciousness, and people are going to bring up subconscious stuff. And, yep, yep. and I think Esalen, which is going to celebrate its 60th anniversary um, next year. And that is, in a way, the almost the only good precedent that, that in, in the sense that it survived for a long time. Ah. Um, so it has that kind of um, that longevity, which is so lacking in, in spirituality. It, it never it never kind of no one ever captured the flag. It was it was, you know, it, it wore its dogmas lightly. It was open to criticism. It never became culty in an era where everything else became culty. You know, like the '70s human potential movement, Osho, yeah. EST, but somehow Esalen didn't. Um, so, so of course it's flawed, but I think that's quite a that's an interesting precedent. And the last thing I would say is, um, oh, well, go on, yeah. I've said well, I, I wanted to give you a couple of uh, another precedent to consider. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And this is one that Thomas Bjorkman has brought out, the Nordic Seeker. Um, I forget the, his co-author, the the the, the Bildung movement in the Scandinavian countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Which I mean, so you see the Scandinavian countries at this one point in history, they're agrarian, they're authoritarian, um, and what you, you, what you the Bildung movement moves from Germany, and they set up basically, and there's no other way to describe these these secular monasteries where people go in and and they're and they're basically doing self cultivation, Bildung, right? 
and self-transformation. And they're doing this project and it's spiritual and it's philosophical and, mm -hmm. it, and it transforms the Scandinavian countries into the mm -hmm. countries they are now, radically mm -hmm. different than they were before. And it didn't evolve into, as far as I can tell, anything sort of cultish or a new religion. And, and you know, Thomas points to that, uh, I think quite rightly as, uh, you know, as existence proof. No, no, it is possible to find that space that you and I keep trying to circle in. And it, it can be cultivated in a way, and it can be cultivated such that it can transform, and not just a country, a whole region uh, in, in, a, in a profound way, in a profound that's, way. That's, yeah, that, that's very interesting. Um, you know, it also reminds me of um, a book called The Diamond Age by Neil Stevenson, which is, I'm not a big sci-fi fan, but this is one of my favorite kind of sci-fi books. Yeah. And it's about a kind of artificial intelligence Enchiridion, a handbook, uh, which someone designs to develop good characters in, uh, and, it, and it's a huge amount of money invested and then it gets stolen. So a street urchin gets this uh, incredibly <laughs> intelligent handbook, which gives her like, in, like 21st century ancient wisdom and, and, and it, she, she becomes this kind of great character. But um, in it, um, there's, it's set in the future and there's this, there's this uh, one of the fundamental questions it asks is how do you create an educational system that both reinforces traditional values like ancient wisdom? Because that's in some ways, you know, but also creates a space for like new thinking, yeah. for subversive thinking. Yeah, yeah. Now, what we've got at the moment is sometimes we get like people on the right and they're all about traditional values, yeah. whether that's Confucian, Aristotelian, yep. Stoic, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Or you get people on the left and it's all about subversion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 there's, and there's no center there. It's all about the kind of, what, what's the opposite of, you know, there's the kind of centripetal and something else, right? So yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's not about the center. It's all about, you know, undermining the center or subverting the center. So how does one bring that together? Like have a kind of a, a, an educational system which gives people a kind of training in ethical habits, but with the, with the space to kind of, yeah, to subvert and, and to improvise. That, that's um, exactly it. I mean, and so um, the, 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 the metaphor people are frequently using, uh, I've used it myself, is, is the jazz metaphor. You, like, mm. if, if, you, if you can't play formal music and you try to jam, you'll just, it's horrible, right? It's just a mess. Uh, yeah. but, but in jazz, of course, you're doing, you're, you, you, you break the rules in a way that feeds back into the rules. Like, it's, you know, it's, yeah. James Carr's idea of an infinite game as opposed to a finite game uh, and learning yeah. how to play that. And Zach Stein, uh, one, of my, um, one of my collaborators, uh, you know, Education and Time Between Two Worlds, he's, he's, he's exactly exploring that. He's exploring um, how do we reorient education so we can both reach into the past and foresee the future, um, if, if you'll allow me a visual mm -hmm. metaphor, mm -hmm. um, at least a, a, a perceptual metaphor. And so what's interesting, like, you see the brain actually organized to do this. I mean, this is the work I do on relevance, realization, insight, problem solving, how the brain is constantly oscillating between, you know, strategies of assimilation and strategies of accommodation. And, and that you, what, when we're measuring intelligence, we're often measuring the flexibility of that system. What we actually want is to promote the flexibility. And so Zach mm -hmm. is trying to ask that, but he's asking that in, in connection with uh, what he claims is a fundamental reorientation. So I want to suggest to you that part of trying to find that, that, that education that finds that center point and balance is also a reorientation of education. And, 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 and so one of Zach's main criticisms is that we have lost the function of education as intergenerational enculturation. We used to think, so you, you look at cross culturally or you look cross historically, Education is viewed as primarily an intergenerational relationship of responsibility, and it's a, resp and it's a responsibility of, uh, uh, of enculturation. One of, so we humans have the capacity for cultural ratcheting. You and I don't have to start from scratch. That other organisms do. We don't have to start from scratch. We have this, but the point is we're supposed to ratchet. So we're supposed to start from this, but go beyond. And so his, his point is, we, we've largely taken education out of that, and then we have reoriented it towards preparing people for the market. 
and that ha that that has failed for for various reasons, uh, and and some of those reasons are being exacerbated. So as the rate of technological uh, change increases, trying to prepare people for the market is largely a fool's errand, right? And so, like I was told this, and this was you know a while ago, um, you know. Uh, as I was going into university, it's like, you're not going to have a career. It turned out they were wrong. I managed to get one. Mm -hmm. But they're saying, you know, most people are not going to have a career. They're going to have six, five, six careers. And so trying to make education about preparing them for their career is like, I'm not saying we shouldn't prepare people economically, but trying to make that the, the defining essence of education is largely a failing, it's a failing project. And it, in, so it fails in, the, in, in its own manifest goal but also fails for a latent reason, which is we've abandoned the cultural project. You know, the, 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 the project that, no, the point of education um, is to create a stable relationship between generations of enculturation. And so I think part of the problem, sorry, this is long-winded, but part of the mm -hmm. problem is that if you'll allow me a dimensionality, it's not only that we're trying to recover, and I don't mean the political center by any means, and you didn't, I didn't think you meant that either, we're trying to recover this center where we get both ecstasis and rigor, if you'll allow me that. But I think that can't be separated from, we have to, and, and this is why I, I'm a little bit worried about it becoming therapeutic, because therapeutic is me now self-focused. We have to recover this other kind of focus, right? That, that what education is doing is it's, right? I, I'm, I, I am, I'm grateful for a gift and I'm responsible for giving if I can put it that way. And so I, I, my concern is that some of these, like a lot of these uh, things you're talking about didn't have that intergenerational focus and that helped to explain their failure. And now I'm, I'm getting back to the point, whereas the building movement in Scandinavia had exactly that intergenerational mindset and that's at least a plausible hypothesis of why it succeeded in the way it did where these other things failed. Sorry, that was a bit of a long-winded argument, but I wanted to make that argument. Yeah, well, um, you know, I would love to see examples of that today, whether that can work. I'm all for like, you know, as many experiments as possible. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the experiments of, 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 of institutions and see, you know, can, can, how do they work? Can they, can they last longer than two years, three years? Um, uh, can, uh, can they deal with the, the money issue? Uh, yeah. Can they deal yeah. with the power issue? Can they, um, can they avoid yeah. from just getting lost in kind of, you know, paralysis where where it's it's so much kind of challenging the center that there's 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 no actual kind of you know agreed ethics there. Um, I I I can tell you that um, trying to change uh, within British uh, academia was well just within my university um, for eight years uh, I tried to get them to develop a kind of more coherent well-being policy. Uh, which would involve things like, you know, courses and workshops and classes in practical philosophy. Um, and, uh, you know, the progress was so slow and there was so much um, weariness, suspicion, uh, maybe, you know, a just complete indifference from senior academics. Um, if, if one of them maybe then showed interest, then they would leave after a year. So it was... Um, I have to say, I got I got nowhere. And yeah. I heard something yeah. similar from the president of Harvard. He said, you know, he, he did his best to introduce things like um, courses in happiness, um, like, you know, both psychological and, 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 and ancient wisdom. Um, but then the person who taught the, the course, like Harvard's most popular course was its course in happiness. But then the person teaching it would leave and the university would not feel that this is essential to, right. to get someone to replace it. It was always just, you know, someone's initiative. Exactly what happened at my university. I was into it, but as soon as I left, no one felt it was essential. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Universities are massive, massive corporations. Yes, yes. Uh, and they are mainly looking at expanding, particularly internationally. So attracting as many foreign students as possible who may, may often barely even speak English, but they'll spend, you know, 30,000 a year. Yeah. 
These are huge money making machines. So it is it is hard to to bring in any kind of um, culture of wisdom there, even if you were the provost, even if you were the head of that university, let alone a semi academic like me. So I, I guess I've become more interested in in kind of smaller uh, institutions um, where you can try to have a genuine kind of uh, sure. shared ethos, right, right, um, right. A, sh- a shared you know spirit. Um, and I'm also just interested in like you know this kind of like adult education where you put out maybe a book or an online course or something, and you know the people who really want it they will find it. Mm-hmm. And you, what you get is like, um, you know, like to, to me, the most incredible technology of education is still the book. Yeah, yeah, um, I agree with that. I agree you, with you that. You put a book out, book out there, and someone spends, you know, ten hours giving their deep attention to you, and 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 it can change their life. Mm-hmm. So, so, so that kind of thing. Like, um, I, what do you think? Am I being too pessimistic, or, or, or? well, I'll, I'll tell you, Jules. I mean, uh, 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 no, my friends uh, actually, uh, it's not an accusation because they, they love me, they're my friends, but they, they attribute to me that I wear a cloak of melancholy um, and that I, I, I tend towards a, a, a seeing things darkly. And mm. I, I hope I did not convey, I share with you uh, a, a sense of deep urgency around what Thomas Bjorkman calls the meta crisis, because those mm. crises you mentioned, they're not, they're not independent. The, the wealth disparity, the uh, the environmental degradation, the political like frustration, ossification, corruption, the, the, our political institutions are being, those things are not independent. They're 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 interacting and exacerbating and uh, each other. I happen to think that the meaning crisis also puts people into a kind of scarcity mentality, and scarcity mentality makes mm. people much more short-term thinking, much more rigid. So I think it also exacerbates things in a profound way. So mm. I often, I, I mean, I, I went for a walk with a good friend and, you know, and he was saying like, he's, he, he was considering having a child and he's thinking not, and he's really mm. wrestling with, you know, uh, you know mm. issues around despair. And, and I think it's a race. Uh, that's how I feel it. I feel it's a race between the kind of work you and I are doing and many other people, you know, and, and all these other forces and, and they, and the other forces have tremendous advantage. They also have tremendous, um, I, I, Whitehead once said the, the one thing we, the one, one of our great sources of hope is that evil is very self-destructive in nature in the long run, right? And so these huge machines also are incredibly, they're incredibly powerful, but they're also incredibly self-destructive. They're mm. suffering from general system collapse to use some technical mm. language. So, mm. I mean, and that's both good and bad. Um, so I, 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 I don't, I'm, I, I, I don't think there's any teleology that is is guaranteeing anything. Um, and I do seriously consider the fact that we, I'll just, I don't mean to sound grandiose about us, mm. that we might fail. In the, you know, the, all the people that are trying to wake us up to wisdom and meaning and and, and, mm-hmm. and, right, that we might fail. I, I, I totally, I, I totally get that. Mm. And so I, I guess I console myself this way. I, I console myself with that. Uh, uh, well, uh, it's certainly not going to make any. It's not going to help things if I don't try. So I'm going to try my best. And I have kids, mm. so that especially motivates mm. me. I'm going to try my best for them, and also mm. for my students and for my friends. And then you know, I talk about stealing the culture, like we're not going to do this by a political revolution or something like that. But I also mean the possibility that, that maybe we're like uh, Augustine. Maybe what we're doing is we're not saving the Roman Empire. It's too late. What we're doing mm-hmm. is gathering together the candles that we can and, and mm-hmm. storing them in a way that's going to survive so that something else could mm-hmm. potentially be built from it. And that's how I try to console myself. I, and I know that sounds rather grandiose, but that is how I try to. <laughs> How do, how, how, how I try to deal with this tsunami of pessimism, pessimism that could wash over me. That's how I introduce myself. Maybe I'm Augustine. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I hear you. And I and I, it's funny, I was thinking about that, um, I guess, a couple of days ago, thinking like, um, you know, obviously the, the news is 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 
it, there's 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 tough news every day now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, of, of you know, particularly around the climate, um, but 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 other things as well. And um, and I was thinking, um, if this is you know uh, a kind of end of end of an order kind of time, that is also a, a very fruitful time because because uh, something like you know Saint Augustine and his and his new view can be hugely influential yes. in, in that kind of time after that you can't quite predict who, who that person's going to be or what that idea is going to be. Um, so I think you're right there. Um, I don't believe in a kind of set goal, but I do believe, you know, that some new order will emerge. Mm -hmm. um, like I, I believe in, in, in some kind of, you know, tendency to complexity tendency to order and we're, we're just in a time of turbulence for you know for better or for worse that's i think what we, it's going to be like this decade next decade um so 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 what's the what, what's the kind of useful work definitely can think about what happens after the turbulence what would you like to see after the turbulence what would be the, what would be the good uh, you know it doesn't have to be the perfect what would be the good yeah. And, 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 and the more we keep reminding of ourselves that maybe we make it more likely to happen. And then there's, and then there's work to be done in, in, in consoling people um, through, through suffering. And there'll be lots of suffering yeah. uh, in, in, in the next 20 years. It won't be the first time in human history, but there'll, there'll be a good, good, good portion of it, good helping of it, I guess. So there's lots of the traditions that we work with. Uh, uh, that, that's their forte is, is kind of consolation. Yeah. And I think, um, and I definitely like part of that constellation is 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 kind of hope and cosmic hope, and um, you know the, the the old wisdom traditions um, give us that as well. The sense that like, hey, you know, you can't lose. At some level, you can't lose. Yes, you can. At some level, yes, you know, try to um, mitigate suffering, but um, but but at a certain level, um, that you know. It's not on you. It's not on. It's not on a, a, a few. Uh, you know, thank God, it's not on a few people on kind of uh, on YouTube to try and like um, yeah, yeah, save the world. Yeah. Um, like there's there's something within us that can't. This is my opinion. That can't die. That that that, that can't be defeated. That can't be kind of broken. And it's always there. And and we can sometimes lucky enough to get reminders about it and sometimes we can remind others about it but um and and that's and and you know that doesn't mean you you don't want to just rest in that and go no. oh well you know yeah, yeah, yeah oh so some people died in floods oh so um you know there's some wildfires no you 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 do you do your best um but 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 that's that's um saves me from despair Mm -hmm. um and 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 gives me a certain amount of detachment which helps me to kind of keep going um and i think i you know when i when i think about spirituality and i have felt some somewhat dispirited in the last year about our culture mm -hmm. um because of things like conspirituality and hucksterism yeah. or anti-science making the pandemic worse yes um but I think, um, and part of that's kind of historical is we focused so much on self-actualization yeah. and follow your bliss yeah. and be a super being. And it was so kind of Nietzschean and it was rejecting compassion and charity as yeah. phony or Victorian bunk, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is what Nietzsche did. He hated anything that was to do with compassion or philanthropy. He thought that just smelt bad mm. and, and was basically, um, you know, was not into that. So, um, you know, what, so I feel as a, it's just, it's a glaring uh, lack in spirituality. It's lack of, um, of um, kindness and, and uh, charity and, and compassion uh, and, and a active work. You know, there's, there's a big, really good emphasis on work on the self, but there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a real glaring lack on kind of um, organized attempts to help others. Yeah. which which yeah. you know the, the yeah. old yeah. christianity with all its flaws and, and and judaism and so on was good at so you know what are your thoughts on that how what can we do to help our culture 
yeah. uh, do, 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 do you think, do you, do you, do you agree? And, 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 um, I, and if so, I, what could, what could we do about it? I do. And, and so, um, I mean, so part of what I'm doing as a, 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 a researcher thinker, mm. but also personally, I mean, I'm entering into really good faith and I mean it in both senses of the word, good faith discussion with mm. representatives of, uh, uh, of, you know, Christianity and Judaism. Um, mm. And one of the criticisms of, of, of they often make of my work, and I respond to it, I take it to heart, is, yeah, but the stuff you're talking about, the religion, that's not a religion, all, like, how are you going to scale that? How are you going to do exactly what you're talking about? Mm. Right? And, and so I have tried to move from just talking about this and talking about ecologies of practice, I'm like I'm not abandoning that. I think that's still central ecologies of practice, mm -hmm. but really emphasizing how much the ecologies of practices have to be set within a, a homing community and a community mm -hmm. that that does that. And so, a lot of the work that I'm doing now on is around so taking a notion from four E cognitive science, distributed cognition, and the power mm -hmm. of collective intelligence. And then the yeah. idea, the very strong analogy. So I, as a psychologist, I, I, one of the areas I do work on is how do we use our intelligence to become rational? Because intelligence is only weakly predictive of rationality. You have to use your intelligence and train it in a specific way, mm -hmm. to become rational, uh, mm -hmm. become overcome, be able to you know, systemically and systematically overcome self-deception. Well, part of what I saw the ancient, especially the Neoplatonic tradition of dialectic doing mm -hmm. was, giving people an individual practice of, of self-transcendence, dialectic in this dimension, but also mm -hmm. putting it into this, which is how do we how do we access and activate the collective intelligence of distributed cognition and transform it into collective rationality and dare I say it, collective wisdom that gives us something that helps to curate and correct our own individual wisdom project. And so I've, yeah. I, I'm engaging in this project of trying to understand this process They're called Via Logos. And I'm teaching a course with Guy Senstock on this on the weekend. How do, how, how do people do this? So how do a, a kind of practice, and, and also doing a series on the connection between Via Logos and mystical realization. How do we, how can we get, well, let's use some of the language. How can we get something like a collective ecstatic that is also a collective rationality between people? Because you can because I've participated in it and I've seen it happen. And what's interesting is how spontaneously people from whatever background, religious and secular, start to describe this experience in spiritual language right? and how much they're drawn into this. And, and, and how can we organize that? Because right now it seems to be so that it doesn't focus, because it, it doesn't focus on the person, it focuses on the we space. That's even the term mm -hmm. that's used. Uh, and, and so, trying to understand, see, I'm getting too passionate about this, I gotta calm down. Mm -hmm, trying mm -hmm. to understand, right? Like, and you can understand it from a rigorously cognitive scientific perspective, collective flow state, collective intelligence, distributed cognition, but you can also understand it as, right? Uh, you know, a, a, as, I don't know how, how I don't wanna, I don't wanna sound disrespectful. Mm -hmm. People, I, I don't, I don't think it's, inappropriate or misplaced for people to that they gravitate towards spiritual and religious language to talk about this experience because what they what they do is they discover kinds of intimacy that have been lost to our culture they discover non-sexual non-romantic intimacy first with each other and themselves and those are happening in tandem then they get an intimacy with this this dynamical system and then they start to get a new sense of intimacy towards reality and being through it. And, and what's happening is you get com com communities building up. So during COVID, I, uh, I, I, I started an online meditation, contemplation and cultivation of wisdom. So, and, and a sangha grew up around it. I didn't try and do that. It, it just happened, right? And, and, then it, and then a Discord server and, it, uh, and its own Camille. So, sorry, this is very long winded. I'm getting very excited, but... <laughs> Both as a scientist and as a participant observer and as a participant, right, uh, experimenter, I'm trying to understand very deeply the processes by which we, the, by which individuals build new, I don't know what to call them, something like new cultural homes, new ways of being with each other 
being themselves and being in the world and, and trying to really understand that in a deep way, precisely because I think the, the point you put your finger on is, is the crucial point. My, 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 my friend and colleague, Jordan Hall says, the next Buddha is the Sangha. And, and I think that, that that's, there's a deep- Well, he took that from uh, Thich Nhat Hanh. <laughs> he did? So I hope he credits him, yeah. I didn't know that, I didn't know that. Well, there you go. <laughs> okay. Well, anyways, uh, he brought that to. I mean, I've read Thich Nhat Hanh. I didn't come across that, but anyways. Well, uh, you know, because I read it just yesterday, like, and I never come across that thing before. So it's one of these strange coincidences that you yeah. talk about. Like, um, yeah. So we, yeah. We, we, we might not know where it actually began. So, uh, but uh, mm. I, whoever said it, there's truth to it. And, and, and I'm trying to understand. Um, I'm trying to understand a, a narrative, a, a, nif, a different kind of cultural narrative. Like I, I have concerns about the hero, the resurrection of the hero narrative. Uh, because, yeah, so do I. I mean, yeah, you know, the, yeah. the hero's journey, that's, that's, that's been uh, overly flogged because, you know, the hero is just going round and round and round. And after a while, like, you know, I, I think there's such, there's such a thing as a post-hero where you're mature enough. You don't have to see yourself as like Luke Skywalker anymore. No. You don't have to wear your Luke Skywalker pajamas. It's, I'm thinking of the way, you know, the way Plato eventually has Socrates disappear from the dialogues. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Um, but, you know, um, you know, you know that map of the hero's journey, they're, they're pretty much always on their own. Have you noticed that? It's always just one, one map. Well, that's, 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 that, that's what I said. I said, you know, I'm, I'm interested in, I'm not so much interested in heroes because they don't really build networks i'm interested yeah. in the kind of processes right these distribu yeah. these dynamical distributed processes to build networks well yeah so i hear you and and um you know i think i i bet that you are doing uh, in your field is doing interesting research on kind of the connection between uh, rationality and you know wisdom and an emotion as well yeah, yep and yep. what 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 happens in that kind of those group dialogues yep. where it's kind of um and and it made me think of both the you know in in the 20th century things like the encounter group and more recently things like authentic relating groups yep and I those kind of yeah and I love those authentic relating exercises. But then it makes me think even older about things like the Pentecost. Yep. And, you know, the Pentecost was a, was a kind of collective fire. Uh, the pe yep. People were yep. connected with this, with this kind of spiritual intelligence and they could speak different languages. Um, and so, um, I, and I think that the challenge as well is how to always broaden those dialogues to include the 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 other yeah uh, and um and uh but i don't mean in a kind of um just a woke way uh, and i know and i'm using woke in the kind of you know not in the true sense of the word but in the kind of hackneyed yeah, journalist yeah. sense of the word but i mean um so i guess and because I, I what what i'm also have in mind is in terms of this next 20 years i'm thinking of like increased emergencies increased natural emergencies so i suppose what i also have in mind uh what i would uh, is mm, um this will sound silly but like something a bit like um you know the franciscans yeah you know like or something so that you're you're you know i think or, or like Thich Nhat han's contemplative activism movement where yep. they were during the vietnam war helping people to build churches, yep. um, you know, helping the villagers. So making themselves useful in a, in a, in a time of crisis. Yep. So I, I suppose that a good church would do that in a time of crisis. You'd hope that if the city was flooded, they would be there trying to help people who, who, who'd lost their homes. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, how can our culture be, how can we be of help? Because it seemed to me like, you know, we weren't the only ones. Like, churches were often just as riddled with conspiracy thinking, unfortunately, during the pandemic. Oh, but we, we, we weren't at help. We, we actually made it worse. Mm. So, so just in, in this, in this um, time of, uh, you know, we're, there'll be increased natural disasters. 
um, what can what can, can we be of, of, of uh, how can we be of service? Mm -hmm. That's that's um, that's that's what I wonder. And um, and I and I and I and I I can tell you I do you know pretty much zero <laughs> service. So so I'm uh, you know I'm asking myself that. But I um, you know you tell me if you see that happening and where where I do where, where, yeah. I mean, and, um, and I'm not putting one-upmanship or anything like that. That's not at why all. I, that's, I, that's why I, I, I did that stuff during the uh, mm. during COVID. Uh, like, yes, you do. You're giving you're giving your stuff your stuff away for free. Right. Um. So that's and true. Yeah. The, the coursework, and then also mm. trying to help build communities where, like, yeah, you know, or, 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 or like working with people like Rafe Kelly, who's you know building a community, helping to build the networks between the communities yeah I, I, i'm trying to do that um sorry i that I, I don't want this to get off on self-promotional what i mean is mm -hmm. I, I think the point you're putting your is exactly right and and that mm -hmm. that's you know that's back to epicurus call no man a philosopher who has not alleviated the suffering of others right that that yeah that point that and and, and you know and i think that's that's also part of when jonathan Pajot and paul vanderclay sort of you know uh criticized me is like you know, but in the end, are, 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 is, your, is your philosophical community going to help when things fall apart? Or is it just, is it going to be, is it going to withdraw like the Epicurean community? Or is it going to try and go out into the empire like the Stoics did, right? Um, and so I think, I think making that question prominent, putting it at the forefront of any proposals for for like how we're going to make institutional, educational, collective, and individual change. I think that's important. I think I think I, I totally agree with that. I don't. I think in fact, if we don't do that, we're we're going to suffer the fate of the Epicureans. Uh, they lost the competition first to the Stoics and then to the Christians. Um, right. And and, and, they, and justifiably so, to my mind. Um, not because they didn't yeah. have good ideas. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that they made themselves like. Um, improperly useless i mean there's a there's a right there's a proper way of being useless but they were improperly useless and yes. and, 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 and that goes back to how we started this i mean mm -hmm. if, if if we're doing this if, if it like the advantage of street philosophy is its claim on relevancy and so if we're not yes. doing that we shouldn't be doing anything we should just be mm -hmm. doing academic philosophy to my mind so that's how i right. would include it yes i agree and um, I, 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 there was a Vice article recently on the revival of Stoicism, and and I said in it, um, why has no one set up a Stoic charity? Yeah. Like at the very least, you could have uh, an initiative to get um, a copy of Meditations and a copy of Epictetus's Discourse in every prison library yep. in the exactly. US. That yep. would cost about a hundred dollars yep, yep. <laughs> and like you got you got people like jack dorsey calling themselves a stoic who've got billions yeah well you know and i could afford it as well so actually let me put that on why don't i you know but so so this is a good challenge uh i think for for this broad culture that we're a part of i agree what i what i want to encourage you is that mm. any of the people that i've mentioned that i'm talking to they actually make that the priority so uh -huh. the the what, what it will, if we expand the term to include a much of what we've been talking about, the philosophy is important, but it's important insofar as it supports that that ability to intervene effectively and helpfully in other people's lives. Mm. Um, so mm. that that is also what helps me, at least for moments, take off my cloak of melancholy. Uh, seeing that meeting meeting one of the great gifts of the series. Uh, awakening from the meaning crisis was getting to meet the people I've met, and, and I continue yeah. to meet. That is, uh, that, yeah, that, no, that, and I and I and I appreciate that. I appreciate the kind of generosity of of of, of online education as well, and people like Donald Robertson in the Stoic yeah, movement yeah. gives so much uh, of his content away for free. And there's there's so there's just um, there is a real generosity there, and I think the intention with which work is done often helps it to, to carry you know yeah so jules i promise not to keep you uh i've kept you longer <laughs> than i promised and I, I always like I, i've really enjoyed this i think this has been very good i 
hope we, we can do this again. I would like to do this again. Uh, yeah. So I would like to I'd like to give people that come on to Voices of Reiki sort of the chance to offer any last words or uh, last reflections. Uh, uh. Well, um, I when you were talking about improvisation and jazz, it reminded me of a quote that I, I quoted in um, The Art of Losing Control, where I was talking about the value of religious traditions, even if you don't adhere to them 100 percent. It's a quote by Charlie Mingus. He said, um, you can't improvise from nothing. You've got to improvise from something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So there we go. <laughs> There's a, a nice quote to end from. That's a great way to end things. Thank you very much, Jules. Thank you so okay, much. John. Nice to see you.